Um, so the, the, the purpose of today's lecture is just try to finish and, and the Kita Markov model. Um, in the, I'm just going to start reviewing some of the stuff we discussed before. Um, in the Kita Markov model, we have observation x1 through xn, and we have latent states z1 through zn. Uh, often you see, p uh, we only observe axes in those uh, red box. And often you see people um, add the arrow, meaning, well, we start from generating Z1, and then use a Markovian probability, keep ge generating the remaining Zs, and then conditioning on Z, the latent states, we can generate the X, okay? And first I wanted to uh, point out that I don't want you to uh, look at that arrows, because in some scenario, yes, we do have um, a sense of time, like, you know, this is a, what you observe at time <coughs> one, time two, and so on. Um, but in sometimes we don't. Um, for example, the Kita Markov model actually uh, are qu quite popular for uh, bioinformatics data, where the subscript one, two, until n may correspond to different location on your uh, chromosome. And then the z will be certain latent states, and x will be what you observe. Could be DNA copy number change or expression level. So in there, there's no time. It's just basically location, the subscript. And another bigger reason I want you to uh, look at the graph without the arrow, because there are two type of uh, graphical models in machine learning. One is the one with the arrow, known as the base network. Now, if you don't know what is base network, just ignore that. <laughs> and another one is the undirected graph and they call the graphical model. So hidden Markov model is actually a one type of uh, graphical model. The meaning is we have two n random variables here, z1 to zn and x1 to xn, and we use a graph to represent its conditional dependent structure. Whenever two variables are connected with an edge, meaning that conditionally on all the other variables, those two random variables are still uh, uh, dependent. If a two variable like x1, x2, and there's no edge between them, that means conditioning on all the other variables, they are independent, conditional independent. <coughs> um, so that's uh, the hidden Markov model. And then last time we uh, talk about um, how, to do, uh, how to specify HMM, and we're gonna focus on the case where um, both x and z are discrete, so it's a discrete um, hidden Markov model. Although what we discussed here, here actually can be easily extended to handle continuous case. But let's focus on the discrete uh, uh, hidden Markov model. And there are five elements. We have to know um, n sub z is the number of hidden states. That's a tuning parameter you have to specify. Same as the k value uh, in, uh, mark, uh, in mixture model. And mx is the number of values x take, okay? So you can think about z is a, z i's are discrete random variables taking value from one to m z, and x will be uh, another set of uh, discrete random variables taking value from one to m sub x. And how are we going to specify a hidden Markov model? In addition to those uh, you know, range of the value for z and x, we have to specify uh, a probability distribution over z one, how you generate the first hidden state, and then the transition probability ma matrix from zt to zt plus one. So the A is a uh, matrix. Um, just for simplicity, let's assume we're, we're going to always have a hidden Markov model with three latent states. So M sub Z is equal to three, okay? So that means our A is a three by three matrix. Every row <laughs> is a probability vector, meaning every row summed together is one and they're all positive and, and less than one. And B is the so-called <coughs> emission probability, modeling the distribution from Z to X. So if we have, so the B will be a three uh, times M sub X matrix. Again, every row is the probability uh, distribution. Sum together is one. And so when we talk about hidden Markov model uh, parameter, will be W, A, and B, okay? And then, Last time we talked about uh, the, the issues or computation issues we want to, uh, we want to uh, deal in this class. Uh, let's see. And we, we're gonna talk about how to compute the so-called forward probabilities and denoted by alpha, uh, T, and I. 
So you can think about your alpha as a matrix, and it's going to be n times 3, right? Because the t ranges from 1 to n, and i range from 1 to 3. Here we assume the number of hidden states is 3. Okay, so alpha is a, is a uh, you can think about alpha is a n times uh, 3 matrix, and, we're gonna t and the definition of alpha is here, um, is basically the joint probability of observing a sequence x1 all the way till time t, and also your latent state at time t is i. So we're going to compute alpha, um, we have discussed how to compute alpha and, you know, uh, sequentially. We start with the first row of alpha, of the alpha matrix, and then tackle the second row and go on. And another uh, important quantity we need to compute is called the backward probabilities. It's called the beta. And the beta, uh, again, is T and I. Here the T ranges from, from 1 to N minus 1. Right, because you only observe x n, so your a reasonable starting value for your uh, the last possible, the largest value for t in beta t should be n minus one, because if you s your t is n, you have to calculate what is the what is the chance of observing x sub n plus one. Apparently, that's not in your um, observed sequence. So you can think about the beta matrix as a matrix of n minus one times three. But um, in our calculation, which we discussed last time, we're going to add the last row as all one. So the beta, again, is a matrix n times 3. So often the beta are all probabilities and n times 3. Um, so we're gonna, uh, we actually have discussed how to compute often beta. And then today, we're going to uh, focus on how to compute the MLE of, of uh, theta, and then how to do inference about the latent states. Just in case you forgot our calculation for, for the beta, when we compute, and, sorry, and compute alpha, when we compute alpha, remember it's a matrix, we start with the first row, so t is equal to one, and we do the calcul uh, calculation involving, so for the forward and backward, we always assume we know the parameters, w, a, and b. So that's how we compute the first one. And then we move to the case for t equal to two, and we did our calculation. And then in general, uh, you can talk about, uh, you can calculate the um, alpha, the, t, the row t plus one, based on your calculation from row uh, t. Okay, so that's what um, we computed. And thanks for pointing out there's no arrow here, so I removed it, okay? <coughs> and I think last time we talked about uh, why I draw my uh, graph this way. Uh, on the left, this is a graph where um, all those graphs are a subgraph of the original graph. If you, in case you, and I want you to remember what is the original graph. You have the z's are all connected, well, sequentially, and you have the x at the bottom, right? So when that, that, that graph represents a conditional dependent structure. Now, how you draw a subgraph um, with only, n, um, you know, with those variables on the right, and I, I told you last time, well, how we draw a subgraph, first inherit whatever edges you can have in the original graph. So we're going to have edges here and here, okay? And also here. And then you're going to start adding edges. If two variables, meaning two nodes in the graph, they could be connected by going through a path in the original graph, going through the nodes which, been, uh, which have been deleted, then you have to add an edge. For example, in this case, we see, uh, you know, on the right, right, we see the graph from connected from x1 <coughs> to zt. Here, assume t is bigger than one. Okay. So in general, there's no in the original graph, there's no edge between x1 and zt because given z1, x1 is independent of everybody else, right? But now they are dependent because you remove z1, and z1 is related with z2, z2 is related with all the way to zt. So now x1 and zt are conditionally no longer independent. So you have to add the edge. This is why you have, a, uh, you know, for this, lump of this cluster of nodes, you have a lot of uh, connections. They're all fully connected graph, okay? Um, so this is how you calculate uh, forward and backward probabilities, uh, sorry, forward. Um, how we compute the forward probabilities, um, you can go back to look at the uh, calculation. 
the main technique we use is chain rule. For example, if you want to compute this joint probability, you start with a marginal and you know, ZT plus one condition on all the previous one and you realize it would only depend on ZT. So everything in gray means and you, know, you can ignore them in the conditioning. And then XT plus one given all the previous variables, it turns out only depend on ZT plus one. So we can se sequentially reduce the computation to um, the previous alpha and A and B, okay? So you, you, you can compute your alpha matrix starting from the first row and keep com uh, sequentially computing the remaining rows. And similarly, you can compute the backward probabilities. And we're going to have our beta matrix. This time, we're actually going to go backward. And we're going to start with the last row, which is uh, going to be O1. And you compute your first meaningful row in your beta, which is n minus 1. And you keep computing back. So you can get your, um, get your beta matrix. Um, I have a question here. Let me focus on, let me look at uh, the graph on the, on the left lower corner, this one, okay? And as we mentioned before, now this doesn't look like the original graph because this is a subgraph. We have to start adding edges, right? So it's something like this. And then there's a question, I don't know whether you have that question. When I first show you the uh, hidden Markov model, which is this one, I have to make sure the two screens synchronize. Um, at least in previous lecture, we talked about how to get the joint likelihood for Z1, Zn, and X1, Xn, right? How we compute it? Well, we have our W to generate Z1, and then we sequentially use the A matrix to generate you know, Z2 given Z1, Z3 given Z2, all the way Zn given Zn minus 1, right? And then we calculate the uh, distribution of Z1, uh, X1 given Z1, X2 given Z2, and all the way to Xn given Zn, right? And it sounds like if I have a graph, I just need to find out the distribution over every edge, and then just sort of pro just take a product of them. This is what seems like what I'm doing, right? Now, if that's the case, then you go back to look at the graph we've been spend a lot, lot of time talking about how to compute the forward and backward probabilities. For example, for this one, for the graph on the left lower corner. Uh, why we make such a you know, complicated thing? Either way, we can find out the um, probability assigned to every edge and just product them. The thing is, that's not the right approach. I actually hide some details, and I did add a link to an, a sh I, when I say short, I think it's about 50 or uh, 40 pages of PDF file, uh, a, a brief introduction about graphical model. So in graphical model, you ha if you have a graphical model, let me, let me just pick this one, okay? If you have a graphical model, um, there's a theorem telling you how you write out the joint um, probability. It turns out it is a product, but product over clicks. So what is a clicks? A clicks refer to a group of uh, nodes that are fully connected. Meaning, for example, let me go back to the um, hidden mark and uh, this graph, which is this one. Um, so basically, clicks actually is a, divi uh, is a, is a, is a uh, we divide those edges into groups. Um, let's find out uh, what are the possible clicks in this graph. Every click referred to a uh, a collection of nodes and their edges, and they have to be fully connected. Meaning, I pick any two edges, nodes out of that group, there should be an edge. Now, if that's it, because you look at this hidden Markov model graph, what are all the clicks? All the pairs, right? You cannot have three of them because they are not connected. So that all the pairs. So this is why when we talk about hidden Markov model, naturally, when we wanted to write out the joint likelihood, it turns out to be product over edges, right? Because it's a very simple and nice um, decom uh, decomposable graph. But if you look at the um, structure we got, where we calculate the forward and probability like you know, this one on the left corner, and you can go back to think about it. Let's look at the uh, graph on the left, and we'll ignore xt plus one. You're going to find out x1 all the way to xt, and xt plus 1, they are fully connected. 
every pair of them get a note. Meaning, you, well, if you want to write down the likelihood, you have to remember a function which uh, going to be a function with how many inputs? Uh, t plus one inputs. Because you have x1 to xt and zt plus one, right? So it's almost remember a joint distribution over t plus one discrete random variables. And this is why the computation getting very difficult. We have to go with this recursive uh, formula. Got it? OK, so that means um, although when we uh, draw those graphs, uh, it looks like you know, there are edges, but knowing, and first of all, there's nothing uh, about a probability over every edge. So uh, you basically have to uh, just remember the whole joint distribution over all of them, which is difficult. So we have to go with those uh, recursive formula, OK? Um, so we know how to do um, forward and backward. Now I think we're ready to um, talk about the EM algorithm. So what is the EM algorithm? Um, we observe a sequence x1 through xn from a hidden Markov model. And the parameter here are w, a, and b. And we wanted to find out theta that maximize and the likelihood, or equivalently maximize the log likelihood. Of course, that's the log likelihood over x. But what is the uh, likelihood for x is actually um, there's no simple form. You have to sum over all latent state z. So here, my x and z are all in both phase, meaning uh, it is a sequence, x1 to xn, z1 to zn. And because of summation inside the log, um, the computation is going to be difficult. And it is a perfect example for us to apply at the EM algorithm. So how are we going to do the EM algorithm? We're going to work with the log likelihood for the complete data, including the latent label z. Again, z is both phase, and also I purposely keep z as an uppercase letter, indicating we do not observe z. So in the future, we have to average out z. Okay. So what is the log likelihood for the complete data? It's simple. We start with a w and z1. Once we generate the first hidden label, we can use the, the, the A matrix, which is the transition probability, to sequentially generate zt plus 1 given zt, meaning go to the A matrix, find out the corresponding entry in the A matrix. Once we generate all the z's, then we can just call the emission probability matrix to generate uh, xt conditioning on zt. Okay? So this is the product. And then once we take log, it just becomes a summation, right? What are we going to do next? We have to take expectation to average out all those uppercase Z's, right? Now, what, what meaning we have, to, um, we have to compute the distribution of Z1 through the N, given the data X1 through Xn, and some initial parameter theta, OK? Uh, as I mentioned before, z is a discrete random variable taking, uh, let's say, three possible values. Let's uh, always assume mz is three. And there are n of them. So that apparently they are not independent. So the joint distribution for capital Z, z1 to zn, could be uh, impossible for us to you know, uh, track if n is large. Uh, it, but turns out for the EM algorithm, if you look at what are the expectations we need to evaluate, we only need to evaluate the marginal distribution of z and at the most a pair of them, a pair of joint distribution. We don't need to know what is the joint distribution for n of them, right? So it turns this is the most the, the joint for z t and z t plus one probably the most complicated one. And so we need to calculate, well, given some initial value theta, and what is the conditional distribution of z t and z t plus one given x. Okay? How you think about this gamma? The ga you can think about for every t, gamma is a matrix, three by three. Okay, every entry is a probability, and some of the nine numbers should be one, because it's a joint probability distribution for a pair of random variables, right? So that's your gamma ij. Agree? So gamma, you can think about gamma sub t is a matrix, three by three. And the one one's entry is, what is the conditional probability of zt equal to one and zt plus one equal to one, okay? So do that for every of the nine pairs, which are the all possible values for the ij. How is this different from the a matrix? A is different, a is a conditional. So the a matrix is saying every row 
is the distribution over only the next t plus one conditioning on z. Yeah. So in this case, if you, you have if at the bar, if you move the z t to the conditioning, you basically take your gamma for every row, normalize it by the row sum. Yeah. So it's different. So here's a nine number sum together is one. Okay. So if you do every row sum, you get a three by one vector. What is that? It is a marginal distribution for zt, right? Because marginal, you, know, you get joint, you get marginal and uh, of one, one random variables. So um, we have such gamma matrix, and how many of them? There should be n minus one of them, okay? Because t can take value from one all the way to n minus one, and the last, the largest value for t is n. So let's say conditional uh, distribution for z n minus one equal to i and z n equal to j, okay? That's the main quantity you need to compute. Uh, we're going to talk about how to compute that just in a minute. But once you know this ma gamma matrix, then you can implement um, you know, the E step. So this is basically, the expectation is basically the G function in your EM algorithm. Uh, let's take average, let's take expectation. Well, the first term is the expectation over Z1, okay? And the second is the expectation over ZT and ZT plus one. And the last one is the expectation over ZT, right? Because all the Zs are discrete, expectation becomes summation. Okay, so we got this. Now for the last equality, I just simply, um, um, you know, switch the order of the two summations, the, the second summation and last summation. I switch the order, I move, move the summation over T and inside, okay? Uh, of course, once we, we do the calculation, we know what we're going to do next. We, next, we wanted to find out W, A, and B to maximize this function, right? That's in our EM algorithm, because W, A, B are our parameters. Well, let's continue to do the, uh, organ and the, the uh, continue to reorganize those terms. The first row here, the first row is just a copy of whatever on the previous slide, okay? And then I keep the first summation the same. For the second summation, um, I basically take the summation over t. You know, this thing, I just uh, introduce a notation called the gamma subscript plus. And then rewrite that double summation as, you know, specifically summation over i and summation over j. I add a bracket, but you can ignore why I need to add a bracket just in a minute, okay? And for the second summation, I keep the outside summation over i. And the inside summation is over time t from 1 to n, okay? Now, for xt, which is the observation we observe at time t, it can only take m sub x different values, okay? So I can sum, break that summation over t into the following double summation. First is sum over all possible value of xt. So l is from 1 to mx. And then the inside is a summation over time t where your xt is indeed equal to L. Can you follow this uh, sum over t become the summation of L and summation over t and xt is equal to L? For example, we observe um, our n is equal to 100. So we observe a 100 sequence. There's x1 through x100. Suppose can x can only take six different va values. Then I can just look at the, the sequence and put them all equal to one as one group, or the time t they equal to two as second group, all the way to group six. That's where we have the summation L from one to six, and the inside summation of all the time points, your xt is indeed equal to L, right? Okay, so that's, so uh, we, we are ready with, finish the reorganized organization. The second one, this one? Yes, in the second, the summation t equals one to n minus one. It is t n minus one. Yes, where does that go in the second gamma? You mean this one? Oh, I just have this symbol called gamma plus. Okay, so that's Yeah, so when I say, when I have a symbol, if the gamma used to have an index i, when I say sum over the index, of course you be clear here sum is over only t n minus one. So the gamma subscript plus is a shorthand notation of sum over gamma t, whatever, uh, you know, t is from one to n minus one in this case, okay? So next, we, we wanted to um, update the parameters W, A, and B. Uh, it turns out the, uh, the optimization isn't too difficult. 
we're actually going to repeatedly use the following results, which uh, I think I have proved before. What is the result? Uh, consider a following function of w1 to wm. So it's a function of w. It's equal to a1 times log w1 plus a2 log w2 all the way to am log wm. Here, all my a's are non-negative. It could be equal to zero. It could be a fraction, like one-third or 1.2 and not necessarily integers. And my w, and w1 through wm, is a probability vector. We don't know. We wanted to optimize respect to w. What I mean by a probability vector, I mean all the w's are between 0 and 1, and sum together is 1, OK? So we discussed what is the optimal choice for w. The trick is to rearrange the jw as some kind of KL divergence. And eventually, you're going to find out the optimal choice for w should be proportional <coughs> to a. Meaning, what is the optim optimal choice for Wj should be proportional to Aj. But because Wj is a, is, a, is a probability vector, that means Wj is equal to Aj divided by the sum of those A's. So that's the optimal choice we have shown before. Now we're going to repeatedly use this result to find what is the optimal choice for W, A, and B. OK? Can you still follow? Any questions? So let's first find out what is the optimal choice for W, that, this W, Wi. So the W is a 3 by 1 vector. I only appear in the first term, right? You just directly grab this result. Well, I think the optimal choice for my Wi should be gamma 1i. Well, I should divide it by the sum of gamma 1 over i, but because this is already a probability, you can go back to find a definition of this one. So it's already 1, OK? So you're going to find out the uh, optimal choice for your W, which is a distribution for Z1, is equal to uh, this. So this basically is a conditional uh, distribution of Z1 given the data and the initial estimate of the parameter, which is very reasonable. Next, let's update A. A is a matrix, 3 by 3. Every if we fix I, and every row of A is actually a probability vector. Okay. So you can go back to find out if you fix i, so you can think about i is 1, OK? Then you want to pick what is optimal a1, comma 1, a1, comma 2, a1, comma 3, OK? So if you fix i, if you look at this expression inside the bracket, you're going to find out, well, the optimal choice for aij should be proportional to this number, because we just use our result, right? And so that means. Um, you know, the optimal choice for AIJ is equal to uh, this. We have normalized it. Now, if you uh, spell out what is gamma subscript plus, you have another summation over T from 1 to n minus 1, OK? So next, let's uh, look at how you're going to optimize B. Again, B is a matrix. Every <coughs> row of B is a probability vector, OK? So that means we can, let's just fix i and find out what is the optimal choice for the, b, the i's row of b. And you can go back to find out where, um, you know, if you look at this one, you're going to find out, well, if you fix i, so you, you can put a bracket right after summation over i, and you could quickly realize, well, the optimal choice for b should be proportional to this number. Again, we use this result um, shown here. So you have your optimal choice for, for B. So you, finish the, um, so you finish the updating. And you can, once, so let's think about, let's just um, ignore the last comment. Let's think about your, uh, the flow of your EM algorithm. Uh, in your EM algorithm, you're going to um, start with some initial value of theta, calculate your gamma matrix, and then use the formula we shown on the uh, later slides to up it, update your W, A, and B, and then re-update your gamma calculation, update your W, A, and B, and continue doing this until convergence, right? So this is your EM algorithm. Now, I do want to point out sometimes um, some algorithm, they don't update W. So what is a W? W is a distribution for Z1, right? Now, uh, consider the case where 
and somebody's using a loaded die. Die, if you throw a die, you're going to see six different outcomes, right? A die or dice. Yeah. <laughs> you have six possible outcomes. So you have to estimate six probabilities. Um, but if I only toss a die once, do you think you can get a good estimate of the six probabilities? It's almost impossible, right? Now you can think about what is W. W is trying to model Z1. You only see one realization of Z1. And you may get a little bit of information through uh, you know, X2 or later, but just overall, there's only, even if I tell you what is the latent state for Z1, your estimate won't be accurate. So this is why in some algorithms, um, they just don't update W. Just start with the initial value equally likely over the three latent states. And that wouldn't really affect your calculation that much. Okay? So in your coding assignment, you will be asked not to update W because that's also what the hidden Markov model package um, produced. W stay the same as the initial value. Okay? So we know, get a rough idea about the EM algorithm, but next thing is, well, there's a major thing we need to compute inside the EM uh, updating is the gamma matrix. We have gamma 1, 3 by 3, gamma 2, 3 by 3, all the way to gamma n, you know, n minus 1. There are n by minus 1 of, you know, uh, n minus 1 matrices. And if you um, look at the quantity for gamma, it's just equal to the conditional probability of zt equal to i, zt plus 1 equal to j, conditionally on the data, okay? Suppose our uh, latent state, there are three different latent states for Z, so you're going to compute for every time T, you have to compute nine numbers, right? You can actually just compute the joint, joint likelihood of ZT, ZT plus one, and X. And then once you get the nine numbers normalized by their sum, you get a conditional probability, right? So it's okay to work with the joint. Now once you get the joint, and here's the graph uh, shown here, um, you can, they, then we're going to use the chain rule again, marginal of uh, first x1 to xt and zt, and so joint of those uh, on the left corner, and then zt plus 1 given all those variables, but that only depends on zt, so you get the A matrix. And then xt minus 1 given all those variables, it only depends on zt plus 1, you get B. And then this cluster, <coughs> that's our beta. So your calculation for gamma turns out to be forward probability, which basically compute the joint, li joint likelihood of this cluster of nodes on the left, and then you have your transition over zt to zt plus 1, and emission from zt plus 1 to xt plus 1, and then the backward probability. And this part is <coughs> calculated with the forward. So, the ca so the, once you, you know how to compute your alpha and beta, and then you know how to compute your gamma. So in your EM algorithm, you start with some initial value of theta, update your alpha matrix, update your beta matrix, calculate your gamma matrices, update your W, A, and B. You're done with one iteration and go back. With a new parameter, update your alpha matrix, alpha means all the forward probability matrix, Opta, update your beta matrix, and then calculate your gamma matrix, update your W, A, and B. Oh, well, you don't need to update W, but update A and B and go through the loop again, okay? So that's the flow of the EM algorithm you need to uh, finish. Questions so far? No? Okay. So um, we can actually compute, given a, a hidden Markov model, discrete, we can use EM algorithm, which is known as the bowman welch algorithm to uh, estimate those parameters. Um, now, the, the last task I think um, people might be interested is, now we observe x1 through xn, we estimate the parameter theta, what can we see about the latent states z1 through the n? Um, one um, a reasonable um, uh, you know, request would be, what would be our best guess for those latent states z1 through the n? Um, it turns out there are two solutions depending on the definition of optimality. One is our best guess for ZT will be uh, only based on the marginal, marginal distribution over ZT, meaning um, 
we're going to give a value for ZT. It is the most likely value for ZT, but marginally, or I call it individually, because we evaluate what is the uh, distribution of ZT given X, and that's actually something we is, is part of the gamma matri matrix. So you can get this number, then you just assign the value I if I maximize this conditional probability. And this is optimal in the sense that if you're trying to measure, um, you know, suppose there is a two latent states, Z1 through Zn, and we want you to measure the prediction accuracy, which is whether you Zt agree with the true Zt, and you do the average, um, you know, um, you average that accuracy, then this is optimal because you um, maximize the expected number of correctly identified states. And just because when we're evaluating the accuracy, the decisions are all independently made. So we only, we only, care, up, we only care about the marginal distribution of Zt. Uh, however, there could be a problem because um, your resulting sequence, each, uh, each value at ZT, at time t, could be individually most likely, but if you put them together, they may not even be a valid sequence. Meaning, you could have at time t, your best guess is 1, and time t plus 1, your best guess is 2, but actually the transition probably from 1 to 2 is 0. So this is possible. Okay. So there is another type of uh, um, estimate for Z. It would be, well, we know, once we know the parameter, we observe the data X, we can look at the joint po posterior distribution jointly over the N latent states, right? So how many, N, so this is a discrete distribution with three to the power N different values. There are three to the power N different sequences for Z, agree? Let's pick the one, give me the highest probability. It makes sense, right? Okay, so how are you going to uh, do this? And you, you, I sort of hinted in my previous uh, discussion, it's very difficult to keep track of a distri discrete distribution, which is a joint discrete distribution over n random variables, because they're not independent. So you have to keep uh, a table to remember what is the probability for each of these three to the power n sequences. So it's very difficult to find out what is the maximum. And turns out uh, there is a, a nice algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm, and you can, you can compute this. And now I do want you to pause why I want to give so much detail uh, to you guys. I have a student, and she told me she filled an interview uh, last year because she was asked to describe this algorithm, and she couldn't. <laughs> So, and I feel like maybe I, I should let you know because that could be a problem pop up in your interview. So what is the Viterbi algorithm? First I'm going to, um, let, me, uh, let me first define what is this delta Ti, okay? There are a lot of, again you can think, uh, you can think about the delta as a matrix. T range from uh, 1 to n, I range from 1 to 3. So delta is a matrix, okay? So for the teeth row of this delta matrix, what is recorded? This just uh, tell you, well, um, what is the maximum probability for a, a sequence, a, a latent sequence Z1 through Zt and the observation X1 through Xt? And we also require, as a last point, your latent state is I, OK? Just so you can sort of get a sense. What I'm going to do is I'm going to recursively find out what is the maximum. Um, for example, if I could calculate those, this delta, this matrix, think about what is the last row of that delta matrix. The last row of the delta matrix <coughs> is actually um, the maximum path of all the Z1s to Zn and the observation X1s to Xn. And also at the last point, your Z is equal to one of the value, right? So for example, um, well, I can, I can draw this. So imagine you're going to have your delta matrix, because delta Ti basically can be viewed as a matrix n by 3. Okay? I want you to think about what is the last row of the delta matrix. Suppose in the last row of the delta matrix, the uh, second entry has the highest value. Then actually I can claim for your optimal choice, Z superscript star and hat, 
its last value should, uh, must be 2. Make sense? Think about it. Because you sort of, uh, you know, you, you, you are standing at the last time point, and you look at all possible hidden sequences, and you, well, let's uh, sort all the hidden, uh, hidden uh, sequences in. And among all of them, you landed with one. This is a probability, which is the first entry of the last row of the delta matrix. And then you look at all the hidden sequence that ended at the last position is two. That's the maximum value of them is the second entry in your delta matrix last row and go up. So if the second entry of the last row of your delta matrix is the largest among the three, and you know that if you look at your optimal and uh, most likely single sequence, the last position must be two, okay? I want you to, uh, you may need some time to think about it. So this is sort of the idea. And so we're going to um, first construct this delta matrix. And so delta is an n by three matrix. We're gonna start from the top, the first row. In the first row, there's no max because we're, there's nothing behind the time point one. So we just compute what is the probability of saying z1 equal to i, and you observe xi, okay. Oh, uh, I wanted to, um, here I write all this, um, you know, this is the probability of z1, you know, take this value j1 all the way to zt, take the value i, and I put my x as a lowercase meaning, um, we're not gonna change this data sequence, it's sort of a given, okay? Just, and no, this is notation, and so you calculate your delta one, so you fill in the first row of your delta matrix, and then you move to fill in the second row and go on. And you can go back to look at the, ca the, the calculation for how we get the second row of delta. And there's nothing magic, we just keep using that chain rule, and I'm eventually gonna find out it's equal to something like this. We will use the information we computed um, previously for delta. And also you can go back to compare this formula with the calculation for uh, alpha. Alpha is also kind of a forward ca calculation, right? So the only difference is in, in the delta calculation, we max over the latent state J, but in delta, you average over. So there's some subtle difference between alpha and delta, okay? So suppose you already calculate your delta matrix. Now, we're gonna solve the most likely uh, single sequence backward. And you're gonna first find out what is the best value for the last position, okay? Now let's look at the definition for the most likely single sequence. Is the maximum, is the maximum value um, over the conditional distribution of Z given X? But when we do our calculation for delta, is a joint. But there isn't much difference, why? Because the data is given, x is given, so if you do, if you want to choose, uh, you know, i's to maximize z conditioning on x, it's the same set of value gonna maximize the joint. Of, so you can sort of think about this bar to be just comma, because there's no difference. Agree? Okay. And so um, you can find out, um, that you can pick the, you can find the best value for this single sequence as the last position by looking at the delta matrix, if the second entry is the largest, then you know um, Z n star is equal to two, okay? So once we know what is the best, what is the value for the, the sequence at the time point n, let's go back to look at what is the optimal choice for Z n minus one. First, you're gonna look at the delta matrix, this uh, row t n minus one. You look at the three values, okay? Uh, apparently, you want, you want to pick uh, one of the value, it is the largest, because that's, that tells you, well, suppose I'm standing at time t n minus one, so far based on the data sequence x, and what are the, uh, among all the possible latent uh, sequence z, which one gave me sort of the highest uh, probability? But meanwhile, you have an additional condition. You know that the next, uh, for that sequence, the next value is equal to two, because we just computed an, uh, the previous step, right? So what you need to consider is not only the delta, and also, for example, you look at the delta at n minus one, you want to pick the delta value, you know, among the i, you want to pick a large value, but you also want to consider what is the transition from i 
to 2, because now we know j n star is equal to 2, because, you know, uh, as ending is, is, is equal to, uh, the, la the optimal value for the last position is going to be 2, hypothetically. So you're going to find out um, when you try to pick what is the optimal value for the n minus 1 position, you have to consider um, you know, a product of what happened before, the maximum value, which is delta, and also the transition from time t plus 1 to t, sorry, from time n to n minus, uh, so from time n minus 1 to n, because we know what is the value um, of the z at time n, right? So it's a product. But, but you, you know delta, you know A, just, you know, you can calculate the max. And you can keep doing this every time you have, at a time T, and you wanted to find out, oh, I think there's, there might be a mistake, this, this might be a mistake. There should be, this should be Z T, subscript T, not, not T minus one. Yeah. Okay. And then here should be T plus one. And um, so this is how you do this calculation, always, uh, you know, um, backward, okay? So this is the algorithm I also want you to uh, code. Just one thing I want to share with you is um, I code this Viterbi algorithm and I think sometime on Wednesday. And I checked the answer from the HMM package from R. It seems correct. So I said, oh, okay, I'm just going to um, load this um, to my, uh, tell this, uh, tell this, share the code with my TA. And then just uh, during, uh, on Sunday or Saturday night, I forgot, I was trying to, uh, prepare this uh, coding, coding assignment three and all the documents. And I just wanted to, I, I want to summarize, I want to just make sure the, the un my answer for the Z indeed match with the one from the package. I look at the, you know, Hamming distance basically, just check how many times they are gray, uh, how many times they disagree. Turns out it's not zero. Then I look at the, the, the two sequences, my sequence and the sequence from HMM, and I realize towards end, so uh, in that example you're going to analyze, I think n is equal to 500. So starting from position maybe 475 or some, some you know, the, around that range, the remaining 20 some observations, my z disagree with what's returned in the hidden Markov model. I feel kind of weird because, you know, all this recursive, you get exact match for the beginning, why at the end? Then I, w I went inside and looked at the <coughs> probabilities and I realized the problem. All of those quantities, they are the joint, right? So the deltas involved in the joint probability of, you know, the sequence from, you know, like, like n random outcomes or t random outcomes. So, we, so when you calculate your delta when t is getting larger, let me do the t, it's getting larger. And that number is getting smaller and smaller. Why? Because you are calculating a joint likelihood of more and more discrete random variables. You times a probability which is less than one, right? So this number is, when you talk about the joint, for example, you toss a coin, um, what is the chance of saying ahead? A half, okay? You toss a coin twice, what is the chance of saying um, head and head? A quarter. Now you toss a coin ten times. What is the chance you see all of them and is ha all of them are heads? One over two to the power ten, right? So number. If you're talking about the joint probabilities, when you have your more and more random variables, they're probably getting smaller and smaller, and so small because I get five hundred of them. Then my computer will, when I do my delta matrix calculation, delta calculation. Oops. Um, it becomes zero, okay? Because it's, um, and this is called, it's called underflow problem, or, yeah. Because it's so small, it's so small, the computer cannot handle that number. So the computer just gave me zero. So basically we're looking at, in, in that coding assignment, the hidden states will be just one or two. That means in your delta matrix, there are only two columns. Later on, just all see entry are zero, zero, zero. How can you pick the better value from two zeros? So by default, I keep getting an A, which is the first n number. And um, so this is something you can often encounter. I should have been, I should have, uh, have been aware of that because a typical issue, um, when you are dealing with probabilities and you want to get the max of many probabilities, calculate them at the log scale. So when you implement the Viterbi algorithm, I don't want you to evaluate all the products. 
uh, look at the log, you, you should evaluate the max of log of delta plus log of A. Then that would definitely reduce that um, you know, numerical rounding issue. Okay, good. So I think I'm done with, with this. Oh, it's actually over time.